Earlier on in chapter 7, if you look there at verse 12, you'll find the golden rule. Then um, a little bit next, in verses 13 and 14, Jesus explains the, uh, the straight gate and the narrow gate that leads to life. And then he said, few are going to find that gate. If you look at verses 15 to 20, Jesus told us to beware of the false prophets. Then he concluded that you and I, we will be known by our fruits. But we're going to start reading at verse 21 and read through verse 29. Matthew 7, 21. Uh, let me add, Jesus speaking here the whole way through. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then where I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And as the children were singing, verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears, hears Heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be like unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Verses 21 and 22 are verses that make you stop and think. Question, what does it mean to do the Father's will? The title of the lesson, this message this morning is Doing the Will of Our Father. So the wise man and the foolish man, where they build, that's, that's a concept that's a little bit easier to understand possibly. But talking about the Father's will, did you ever ask yourself the question, you know, Am I doing all that the Father expects of me? Did you ever ask yourself, should I be doing more? Is there more that I should be doing? I know sometimes I did. I asked myself, am I doing what I'm, what I'm called to do? Last week during Bible school, we were reminded that God is merciful and God is compassionate, ready and eager to forgive, and he is. Amen. Praise the Lord. But in all relationships... There are two sides, and this morning, God is doing his part, and the question we could ask ourselves, are we, am I, doing my part? Am I doing the will of our Father? I mentioned this is words of Christ, so on another, another note, just uh, pause on, on the doing the will for a second and think about, consider the teachings of Jesus. As you read through the Gospels, you'll find out he was not always speaking words that the people wanted to hear. And I had to think as I was studying, he's probably, Jesus probably would not make one of those mega church speakers today. He was speaking stuff that they not always wanted to hear and did not always make people feel, uh, feel good. Yet we can read that multitudes followed him. Multitudes sat around and listened to him closely. And if you do some studying, you'll find out at least 12 times Jesus pronounced woe upon the scribes and Pharisees or the lawyers. You read, you'll find at least 12 times. And most likely they were sitting right there. And he said, woe unto you. And he mentioned this group of people. How would you have felt? How would I have felt if he'd been sitting there listening to Jesus' teachings? So here we have some more verses. And I'm especially going to zero in on verses 21 and 22 here after a while. But Jesus is not always saying things that we like to hear. But what can we learn from them? What we have to know as we looked at in the second to last verse, or in the last verse, he taught with authority. Jesus was teaching, not like the average scribe. Do something just a little bit different this morning, possibly. We're going to start at the end, verse 29, and work our way back up. I think there's probably a medical condition for that. But anyway, that's what we plan to do. Point number one. From verses 28 and 29, he taught with authority. So one of the points that Jesus was trying to bring out in the story of the wise and the foolish men here is that we are to hear 
and do what Jesus was teaching. A repeat. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, shall enter, but he that doeth the will. We get to the, the, the wise man. Is he that everyone that uh, hears these sayings of mine and doeth them or does them. So as we hear, as we listen, as we read, as we meditate upon his word, are we taking them or do we listen or are we applying them and living by the teaching that Jesus uh, has for us? The wise will hear and the wise will apply to the saying that Jesus has. But the foolish, as we see here, they may hear, but they refuse to listen. And when Jesus was finished speaking, the people were astonished at his doctrine. So many times I think we would all, uh, we have said it, so many times I think we would agree we'd all like to, have, to be there, so have been there sometime when Jesus was speaking. But he taught and still teaches as the Messiah, as the one, he didn't have to cite the opinions of others, but he had the authority within himself. Sometimes Jesus would introduce his teachings and he would say, you have heard that it has been said. You can go to Matthew 5, 38 and 43 and you'll find that. But then he goes on and says, but I say unto you, revealing that what he is about to say will supersede the authority of the teachers of the law. You heard this back in the day, and they probably said, yeah, we heard that. But he's saying, but I say unto you, maybe introducing a new, a new subject or a, a new topic. He didn't speak like the scribes who intended to lecture. He didn't use words. He didn't say when he's speaking, I suppose this is the way it should be, or I suppose it should be that way, or probably was this way. He didn't, Jesus didn't speak with doubt. No doubt when he spoke. He didn't tell his people when he was done speaking, well, maybe you should consult the experts on that, on that subject. No, because he was an expert on every subject. Jesus spoke with authority. Listen to his authority in Matthew 5, 3. One of the Beatitudes, we probably know it by memory. Jesus was speaking, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Was there any doubt in that subject, in that verse? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Just no doubt, no question about it. Jesus said, those who are poor in spirit will enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is speaking with authority. And when he is, Jesus is speaking, who are we listening to? We're listening to, we're listening to the Son of God. His wisdom is from above. And we listen as he speaks, for he is the Son of God. Jesus spoke with wisdom and spiritual insight, and the people were amazed. But Jesus was not looking for amazed people. That was not his goal when he gets to verse 29, but rather looking for the response of faith to accept what he was teaching. Jesus was looking for those who would consider his words and then make the decision to follow him with all their heart. We looked a little bit back in verses 13 and 14. I mentioned the straight and narrow gate. Jesus was hoping many would enter through the straight and narrow gate. And the gate to eternal life is small and the way is difficult. But through him, through Jesus Christ, is the only way that you and I will spend eternity with the Father. So here we see Jesus speaking with authority. And also in John 3, he said, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Talk about authority right there. He said, folks, you and I here this morning, if we believe in Jesus Christ, we're not going to perish. We're not going to have that spiritual death, but we will look forward to the day that we can dwell with our Heavenly Father in heaven. Eternal life promised without doubt to all who believe. Are we this morning listening to the Master Teacher? Are we taking what, what he is telling us and applying it to our lives and living thereby? I had to think that... When the president speaks, people listen. Everyone wants to know what he says next. Many sit there and criticize, which we're, not, we're called not to do. But when he speaks, they want to hear what he has to say. And as a president, he is speaking with authority. But his authority, when it compared to the authority of God's word, is very, very small. The world that we are living in, God spoke into existence. We think of the authority that God has. Genesis 1, and God said what? And it was so. And here we are today. God spoke it into existence. We serve an all-powerful God. Point number one, Jesus taught with authority. Point number two, the wise and the foolish man, verses 24 through 27. So Jesus spoke with authority, yes, and at the same time, he used everyday stories and illustrations which were easy for the people to understand. 
So two men decided to build a house, one built upon a solid foundation and the other on sand. And that principle stands true today. If you want a building to last for a long time, what will you start with? You will start with a solid foundation. But the house that Jesus is referring to, that he is speaking about, he's talking about our lives. The children said, so build your, your house, build your life on who? On the Lord Jesus Christ, and the blessings will flow as the prayers go up. There we see doing our part, and God is going to do his. Our lives need to be able to withstand the storms and the struggles in life through, as we go through life. And we all know what uh, storms and struggles are like. And victory is promised if and when we live for God and listen and practice the words of Jesus Christ. Those who trust in Christ and prove their faith by seeking to comply with the teachings of the scriptures will have nothing to fear. Maybe that's where uh, I'll be repeating that a number of times. But those who trust in Christ and prove their faith by seeking to comply to the teachings of the scriptures will have nothing to fear. So ask yourself, as we ask ourselves, where are we at this morning? Look at it this way. We're building every day. We're building our lives by the thoughts we think, the words we speak, even by the pictures we hang on the walls of our imagination. We're building our lives. We're taking in content each and every day. And I said the words we speak, we're speaking words. And by all that, we're building our lives. So as we go through life each day, we're building our houses by thoughts, words, and deeds. And our primary focus is similar to building our actual homes. We're not going to use shoddy materials to build our building. The home builders do not use rotten lumber, worn out shingles, and and siding full of holes. In the same way for us, are we, are you, am I, are we using sound, quality, proven materials to build our house? We could ask the question, what, as you go through your life, what is leaving an impact on your life? And that answer may vary through, through many of us, but what is leaving, just think about it for a little bit, what is leaving the biggest impact on my life? And as you're thinking about that, let let me ask, is it the word of God? Is it the gospel message that is changing you and I from the inside out? Do we allow the word of God to change us? We were created and born into this world, but we're journeying through life, we're changing. Is the word of God changing you and changing me? So uh, the Lord has uh, provided many people patterns which we can follow. Yes, he is our great example. He's our good pattern. What about Daniel? A familiar story. He purposed in his heart he was not going to defile himself. And his defilement there comes from the king's food. What about for you and I? Are we going to purpose in our hearts, I will not defile myself with, and you can fill in the X, Y, Z. What about Joseph when he was faced with temptations? He ran away from the woman who seduced him and said what we need to say today. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? What stand are we taking? What's leaving an impact on our lives? Where are we at spiritually? Are we doing the will of our Father? Both Daniel and Joseph were building their lives upon the principles that God has given them. I trust that's where you and I are at as well. As we build our lives, we have the Word of God to guide us. We have examples to follow. We were all blessed with a godly heritage. And the wise will build upon the rock. And every Christian will love to sing, On Christ the solid rock I stand. And when we will say, All other ground is sinking sand. Sometimes that, there, that view gets, uh, gets foggy, but we need to remember that. Christ is our solid rock, and all other ground is sinking sand. So the story of the wise and the foolish man is not simply a children's song. It's the voice of God speaking with authority, providing critical instruction for righteous living. Is your house based upon a solid foundation or is your house based upon something the foolish man was trying to build upon? Are we building on the firm firm foundation, able to stand the storms of life? Philip Brooks, a Boston preacher and hymn writer, was on his deathbed. And most of the time, he was unable to have visitors come in because of his condition. And one day... An outspoken atheist came to visit him. His name was Robert Ingersoll. And Brooks told the nurse, let him in. So after a short conversation, uh, this atheist rose to leave. And he said, you know, Brooks, I got one question for you. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you left me in to visit you. But what about all these other visitors that you don't let in? 
I quote, Brooks answered, he said, I have the assurance that I will see my Christian friends again, but I have the feeling that this is the last time I will ever see you. What was the difference? One of those men was building his house upon a rock, and the other was building his, his structure of sitting on sand. We go through life, we get sidetracked with so many things, but what we need to narrow it down to the fact is that we're on this life for a short period of time, and then will be eternity. The question is asked today, where will you spend eternity? What, based upon the, fact, on the, on the reality of where are you building your house? What is your faith resting upon? Is it the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it the solid rock? Or is it some sand? The third point, doing the will of our Father, verses 21, 22, and 23. So the question was asked, what does it mean to do the Father's will? Jesus says, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. I said earlier, this verse makes you stop and think. So what I see here is saying, Lord, Lord, will not provide a trip to glory. Just so you know, I can, just, if you, we can say, Lord, Lord, does not mean that we will get to glory. Sometimes we hear uh, people, unfortunately, use the Lord's name in vain. And what they are doing is proving that they do not have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think here Jesus is talking about just a little bit different group of people. They were speaking about Jesus Christ as the Lord, but sadly not Lord of their life. So Jesus makes it clear that words are not a sign of salvation. Just because we can say this or that does not, it's not a sign of salvation. Words, even calling by his name, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Did you get that in verse 22? Every, they said, we have done this, this, and this. And every time they said, in your name. And then we have the sad verse, which we'll look at shortly in verse 23. We've got to be so careful. Words, even by calling him by his name, will not inherit the kingdom of God. He promised eternal life for those who believe. He promised eternal life for those who believe. And I just said that he's speaking with authority. But he makes it clear that some who call him by name will not believe. That's what I see in verse 22 there. If verse 21 it didn't get to people's attention, verse, he continues with verse 22. In verse 21 he said, not everyone. Then he uses the word many in verse 22. And when, you have, when you, we use the word many, it means a lot of. But there could be many who are going to say, Lord, we prophesied. And then they add, in your name. Lord, we cast out devils in your name. Lord, we've done many wonderful works in your name. And sometimes, maybe you're the same way, you try to picture in your mind what was taking place. So I picture people begging, possibly on their knees, for acceptance into the kingdom of heaven trying to reason with a righteous judge, trying to get him to see things from their perspective. Maybe to jog his memory about the wonderful things they did on this side of eternity. Please, Lord, hear me one more time, but all to no avail. And then verse 23, probably one of the saddest verses in the Bible, depart, get away from me. And then he he says this, I never knew you. So I get, to the end of, I get to verse 23, and I, I, a question comes to my mind. What is Jesus looking for from you and I today? If you look at verse 21 and 22, you see what he's not looking for, but what is he looking for from us? We're not going to get to the glory, get to uh, words, I'm sorry. Words are not going to help us get by, okay? So we, we find that. Prophecy is going to fall short. Although that's a gift. Casting out devils will not gain access. Although that's, there's some strength, power there. Wonderful works in his name are going to be in vain. So I asked another question. How can we, or is it even possible to pass the test? And you know the answer to that question. Obviously, Jesus promised eternal life for those who believe. So yes, we can pass the test. But we see some confusion here going on. In verse 21, we see the test is not in words. It's not based on our ability to say, Lord, Lord. So it's easy to learn, may I call it, a religious vocabulary. 
memorize Bible verses. We can sing songs, gospel songs as we just were. And at the same time, be living in a disobedience to God's will. That's what, we see, that's what I see here in verse 22. The people were, brothers and sisters, casting out devils and doing it in the name of Jesus. And what did he say? I don't know who you are. In verse 22, we see that the real test is not in words. It's not in, in standing up front and preaching a message. It's not, as I just mentioned, being able to cast out devils. It's not based upon your ability to, to perform a miracle. We're not going to be able to stand before him on judgment day and say, Hey, Jesus, I preached a sermon in Marystown. I was Sunday school superintendent. I taught Sunday school. By the way, Lord, I cooked for the fellowship meal, and we sang in the choir. And that's all a notable thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not downplaying any of that. But that's not what he's looking for. We're not saved by works. Even though the people that Jesus was talking about here, they had the gift of prophecy. They had the power to cast out demons. And they went about performing miracles. But Jesus said, I repeat, I never knew you. So what were they missing? Do we see the answer to the test in the last part of verse 21? Jesus said, He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The answer to the test is compliant. Jesus says, those who are doing the will of the Father. Those who have trusted in Christ and proved their faith by seeking to comply to the teachings of the Scriptures will have nothing to fear. Are we doing the will of our Heavenly Father? Believing with discernment that we take the Bible at face value set to live by it, comply and comply with the instructions given in God's word. When we read, when we study, when we meditate, do we take this and do we apply it? Or, as, or, or are we like those in verse 22 and say, Lord, Lord, but it's not, he's not living in our hearts. We are to live upon the principles that Jesus taught in his word. Someday, every person will stand before God in judgment. And the reality of every person's relationship with Jesus Christ will be revealed. In our Sunday school lesson, we were talking about relationships. And here we have it again. Your relationship with Jesus Christ. That's going to be revealed. And maybe the relationship with Jesus Christ for the people in verse 22 was revealed early so you and I can take to heart. What is my relationship like with Jesus Christ? How does he, does he, does he know me? Does he know you? Are we living for him? Hebrews 4.13 Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him whom we have to do. We will hide nothing. Without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, religious words, religious ways, such as attending church, filling uh, positions of church leadership, and performing good works will have absolutely no value. Without that relationship with Jesus Christ. Luke 13, 25 when, the master of the, when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door, and ye begin to stand without and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence ye are. So I ask the question again, what were the people in verse 22 missing? It appears that they were saying the correct words, but completely missing an obedient submissive relationship with Jesus Christ. They could say words, but their heart was empty. And I, I, <clears throat> during my studies, I, you, uh, excuse me for this illustration, but see if you can bear with me. You could come to our office tomorrow morning. I could sit you down, and I could tell you the words to say to go sell pool building. Joe, you could probably do it. You could come to my office and sit there and I could say, okay, you're going to go out here and meet one of my customers. This is what you're going to say. And there's a very good possibility that you could even sign a contract and, and sell my building. But the real, rea reality is you have no idea what you're selling, I mean, not, to a certain degree. You may have the ability to say the right words, but you have no experience in the field that you just stepped into. And before you get offended, it, in the same way be true if I entered your field. And we'll go pick on the electricians just for, for a minute. When it comes to electrical work, many of you say, well, that's simple. Well, let me tell you, I know enough to be dangerous. So I'll wire something up, then I'll hit the breaker and hope it stays on, because so many times it's dead short and it flies back off. 
It's the same way, well, that's just the physical side, but the same is true on the spiritual side of things. At least Jesus makes that point clear in verse 22 and, and 21 and 22. There needs to be connection between the works that we do and the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. There needs to be connection. James 2.24, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. By works he's justified, not by faith only. Then he says in verse 26, the last part, so then faith without works is dead also. So what we come to the conclusion that faith and works are intertwined. They go together. That's like letting the clutch out and the gears get intertwined and you can go forward. It takes both. And maybe the people in verses 21 22, they were on the works side and Jesus said their faith was not there. Do we have the faith in Jesus Christ? When we accept Jesus Christ as our, our Lord and Master, a change takes place with inside. And I believe Jesus is trying to tell us what we need to see what James wrote about, that uh, works will follow our faith. Works will follow our faith. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit abiding within, and we will do things that will bless and please our Father. Do you have faith? Are you doing the works that follow In verses 21 and 22, I see, I see the works were there. And the people were out doing great and you know, wonderful things. But they were missing the knowledge of and the relationship with Jesus Christ. They were doing the works, but missing <clears throat> the relationship. Missing the faith. <coughs> they could say his name, but he was not in their hearts. So you could, you could try to reason a little bit and you say, well... If I go through life prophesying, casting out demons and performing miracles, isn't that good enough? Isn't that good enough? Didn't I do enough? But Jesus made it clear in Matthew 24 that we cannot cast out devils in, in the name, through the prince of devils. And the people in verse 22, they were casting out devils in Jesus' name. They were using the power of the Holy Spirit, Spirit which is commendable, and they were doing, they were doing much more. But then he quoted verse 23. Depart, I never knew you. And never is a strong word. But he says, I do not know who you are. Meaning, clearly telling us they were missing that relationship with Christ. Jesus said in Matthew 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So what is the will of the Heavenly Father? Well, we could ask, why did our Heavenly Father send his one and only Son down to this earth to die for mankind. John 3, 17. God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. There we see his will. And so we go to Peter. It's not the will of God that any man should perish, but that all would come to repentance through his son. And that is God's will. Repent and be saved. Only possible through relationship with Jesus Christ. We are not saved by prophesying. We're not saved by casting out devils. We're not saved by performing miracles. Although this is great when it's done in his name, but our relationship with Jesus Christ must come first. John, 14, John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And here we see a performance for earthly praise. People who completely missed the mark, missed what was truly important. They were deceived because, well, I don't want to believe in Jesus Christ. Next, I put out the synagogue. Next, people won't like me. And James tells us that the friends of this world are enemies of God. Where are we at in our spiritual life? So again, we ask, what is Jesus looking uh, for from you and I today? A couple of points. Number one, are we living a separated life for Christ? Are we living a separated life for Christ? So remember that faith and works go hand in hand. But what we need to remember is we need to hold the hand of Christ first, then good deeds and works will follow. But Christ comes first. Jesus Christ is not the spare tire. He is not our co-pilot. Number two, our theology and our lifestyle need to coincide. Jesus warns us that we cannot say one thing but live another. Do our words line up with our heart? 
In verse 21 and 22, they did not. And Jesus gives them a very stiff judgment in verse 23. Living a two-sided lifestyle is the same as living near the edge of the cliff of verse 23. Now, we don't want to be there. Do what we say line up with what we are living? I had to think of a Joseph's devotional last Sunday morning about who is going to live with the Lord. He was reading from Psalm 15, verses 1 and 2. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Then the answer is given. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh truth in his heart. There we have more of the will of God. We could cover many verses that tell us exactly what we're supposed to do as, as we go throughout our lives. But there we have the will of God. So when we think about God's will, first of all, we need to think about our relationship with Jesus Christ. But let's pause just for a little bit and take a look at our lifestyle. And i got just a, a number of questions. Number one, are we living in obedience to our Father God? Answer your questions as we go through. Number two, are we living dedicated lives? So we could ask, are we sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you, am I, are we all sold out? Number three, what about our commitment? Are we the people who say, take the world, but give me Jesus? Are we genuine? Are we doing what is right even when no one is around? Are we pure? Am I pure in the eyes of God? And I think the key point there is in the eyes of God, as he looked down upon us, are we pure? Holy. We talked about in our Sunday school lesson this morning. Are we striving for perfection? What is in our heart? Are we righteous? We could ask, are we walking in the light? Going back to some... uh, little thought from Bible school, am I forgiving others as God has forgiven me? I believe that's a key point in, in our Christian lives. We need to be a forgiving people. Another one, am I open with others? Open communication, even when they point out a sin that's in my life. Are we open? Transparent, along with being open, but we have nothing to hide. Character a little bit, are we men and women of integrity? And the last one here, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. We know the fruit of the Spirit is that you and is that me. Those who have trusted in Christ and have proved their faith by seeking to comply with the teachings of the Scriptures will have nothing to fear. So this was not to plant fear in anyone's heart, just to help us to see that we're not saved by a few things, we're saved by grace through faith faith in Jesus Christ. We're holding on to him, then works will follow. Church, may we prepare to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And that's just the verse that, the words that I want each one of us to hear, and not what we see there in verse 23. Close with two questions. Do you know him, and does he know you? And the last one, are we doing the will of our Father? Let's pause for a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you here this morning to say thank you, Jesus, for your goodness to us. And thank you, Lord, for your words from Scripture and what you teach us, God. And I pray that as we look at these verses here this morning, we can search our hearts, God, and make sure that we are doing your will. We're not just going through life doing the motions, but we have that uh, relationship with you in our hearts. And then the works will follow. Help us, Lord, just to recognize the fact that we're saved by grace through faith. Help us, Lord, just to take our spiritual lives seriously and to build upon the solid rock, which is Jesus Christ. You press forward one day at a time, but each day giving you our all. Lord, may we have that dedication and commitment. Be genuine men and women of integrity, God. Just be with us. Walk with us. But may we walk with you, God. Lord, be our pilot, not our co-pilot. Lord, help us just to humbly and meekly follow in your footsteps. Give us wisdom and direction, and may we be doing your will. In your name we pray. Amen. Can you have a song, please, Ed?